Thanks so much, Paula. Uh, we would like to begin our call today uh, with Christy Gray, who is going to be talking with us a little bit about the Virginia immunization uh, system. So over to you, Christy. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Christy Gray. I'm the director of the Division of Immunization here at the Virginia Department of Health. And I really appreciate you uh, giving me the chance to speak with you today. Um, I, I did want to uh, just put a plug in there about how we're very interested in learning about how vaccination is handled in long-term care facilities in general. Um, and recognize that it would depend on the facility as well as resident versus staff. Um, so we are um, interested in learning about that. Um, and I, I did want to also stress the importance of flu vaccination, um, especially this year, more than really any other year, um, with the both um, coronavirus and influenza virus likely uh, circulating at the same time, it will be important to try to reduce the occurrence of flu if possible. And the best way to do that is by getting your flu vaccination. Um, so I, I did want to just put a plug out there about how VDH could help to ensure that residents and staff are vaccinated. If there's a, is the, um, if they aren't getting vaccinated, do you need help with education um, or access to vaccines? We are just trying to get a handle on how we can best partner with long-term care facilities to try to um, ensure that adults, as well as children, but especially in this case, um, adults, both the staff and residents, are as a high vaccination coverage rate as possible. Um, one of the programs that does exist in my division is the Virginia Immunization Information System. That is a, um, a registry that consolidates immunization data from many different sources into one record for a person. So there are uh, different sources that are contributing to that system, including vital records when somebody is born in Virginia, a record is created. Um, when they go get a flu vaccine, when they go get any vaccine, it can be uh, submitted either through a electronic medical record system exchange or manually through the website where you look up the person and you add the vaccine to their record. Um, it is considered a cradle to grave system in which it welcomes vaccines from for any age and any type of vaccine. Um, and it consolidates all those vaccines into the person's record. Based off of that information of the history of their um, vaccines as well as their age, it will also tell the provider viewing it which vaccines that person should get next um, based off of that information. Uh, so it is important that the system has the entire history of the vaccines for the person in order to provide a more accurate recommendation. Um, there are benefits to using the registry. Any person that has a need to access the registry for doing their job, such as reviewing a patient's medical history or a school, reviewing a history of a, of a student coming in to ensure that they have all the vaccines required for school entry. Um, we have health insurance companies that try to look uh, that we provide data to that are attempting to see how many of their uh, clients have the vaccines that they should be getting. Um, so there's uh, the benefits of if you're getting a, a, a resident coming in that's been discharged from a hospital, you can see if they got any vaccines at that hospital and import them into your electronic system, or you can view them through the website and add them manually to your system. It really depends on what kind of tracking or health record system you have. Um, and I also wanted to mention that 
when a COVID-19 vaccine is administered in the future, it will be required by the provider administering it to be to put that vaccine into the into this. So if you, a long-term care facility is not already enrolled in this and participating, we recommend that you do that now. While there is time, we probably have about four to six months before vaccine may be getting out to facilities. Obviously, that is a guess, and it will all depend on how the clinical trials go with the vaccine and then the amount of supply that can be uh, created. But just a guess of four to six months, um, you have to get enrolled now, get familiar with the system, understand how it works, use it for all the other vaccines that your staff or residents should be getting. And um, that way when COVID-19 vaccine is available, you are ready to go and not trying to handle that at the same time. You will not be able to get vaccine without enrolled into the system. I know I only had 10 minutes to talk this morning, so I do want to leave a little bit of room for questions. Thank you, Christy. Uh, we did put the link um, to more information about the registry in the chat. Um, are there any questions for Christy? Well, thank you so much. Um, we will continue to include, in, oh, we have a question. Um, can we use that system to track COVID-19 tests that have been completed? No, not at this time. And, okay. and I will also clarify that there's still a lot that needs to be decided by um, the experts as to what a test result means, such as an antibody test. We're very familiar with uh, hepatitis B titer tests, measles titer tests, mumps. These are uh, standard vaccine prevalent diseases that we have a clear um, uh, opinion in the scientific community about what it means to have a certain level of antibodies and whether a vaccine should be administered based off of that. That information has yet to be decided or determined. So even if we could be tracking testing right now, it wouldn't necessarily indicate whether somebody should get vaccinated. Uh, Christy, another question has come in. Will the vaccine be mandated for healthcare workers? There is no policy right now about mandate of this vaccine. I can't tell what will happen in the future. Gotcha. Okay. Well, we have about one minute left. If there are any other questions for Christy, yes, there is another one. Are you saying that facilities must be in the system to give the vaccine in a long-term care community? Yes, that is what I'm saying. Okay, well, I'm just giving it another second here to see if any more questions come in. And if they don't, I understand this is a lot of information, please feel free to reach out to me directly. We are just trying to get out to the long-term care facilities. This important, it is a bit, the registry can be beneficial both outside and inside COVID-19. Um, and uh, really just trying to make sure that uh, there seems to be a gap of, uh, of knowledge um, we have not done a good job about getting this information to the long-term care facilities, and I'm trying to improve that. Well, I'm putting your um, email address in the chat box. So if folks want to reach out to you, we'll also have links to it in our update today. And then we'll just keep this conversation going. Um, so if anyone has any questions um, after this call, you can certainly reach out to Christy. Um, Great. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, you providing us kind of an overview, and we'll just keep this going and uh, keep communities aware of this system and um, just channel any additional questions to you. But thanks for being on today. Absolutely. I'm happy to come back in any future weekly calls you have um, if requested. Okay, great. Thanks so much.
Thank so you. we we are continuing our discussion about the nursing home reopening guidance. So Sarah, over to you. Thanks for joining us today. Dana, this is Carol. <clears throat> Sarah has a competing um, commitment that's very okay. time sensitive. So I'm gonna step in and just give a little bit of report I can give this morning and share as much information as I can with the group. So good morning, okay. everyone. Thanks for um, joining us, Carol. You're welcome. Um, just as we always do, we like to start with giving you our um, case count for Virginia. So today on our dashboard, we're reporting 63,203 cases and the death count at this point stands at 1,786. Um, so that's the update on case count. Just to let everyone know, we know we have promised the FAQ document about reopening, and that document is pretty well constructed. Each day we're continuing to get questions and interpretation that will make some of those questions and answers clearer. So we're hopeful that by the end of today, we will have that document finalized, but I um, apologize and I'm sorry that it has not come out as soon as we had hoped but we want it to be as accurate and as concise as possible so that it's a really usable document for everyone. Well, Carol, we appreciate um, you. Um, we've been involved in that and our public policy committees provided a lot of feedback on the FAQ. So we just want to um, tell you we appreciate the opportunity to review it and be able to provide questions that can um, help provide further clarification. So uh, we you know, look forward to being able to um, share that information. And we really appreciate that because we want the document to come out to be something that people can feel confident that has been reviewed by all parties involved and answers as many possible questions as, as we can. Um, I will say we'll probably have some core questions that are our most frequently occurring questions. And then we have some other questions that we're awaiting further comments on. So when you see it, just know it will sort of be a living document that will have more additions added. Um, one important thing that is sort of a priority right now is we have boots on the ground, several teams from um, the VA doing voluntary infection prevention assessments across the state. They are only here for this four week period. So this is the second week. So we are really, um, actively involved in trying to get those visits scheduled. They're going well. I hope if any of you all have had the opportunity to have that visit, you all would have found that to be a useful tool. Um, they are reporting back to us each night. We have a drill down um, time with them to just learn if there are any burning issues or questions. And then we also have a weekly evening meeting to really address more in depth any questions or resources that are needed for facilities. One thing that we're hearing is, and, and I think we all know this, is that fit testing and train the trainer sessions are needed for respiratory protection programs. We don't want anyone um, feeling unsafe in an N95 respirator. We want them to be properly educated and trained. And <clears throat> again, I just want to remind you that our emergency preparedness team is offering throughout July throughout the state, um, several sessions for train the trainer fit testing. And we have to have you sign up through Train Virginia and um, make sure that there's space because we of course have to physical distance during those sessions. I did check with, with them and if more sessions are needed, they're willing to try to bring more people on to do that further into the summer. So we hope people will be able to take advantage of that. We know one roadblock is that there is a shortage of fit testing kits and solution. And we, we're feeling that on our end as well, but we don't want that to hinder anyone to com from coming. Um, there will be some fit test kits available through the trainers because we want people to get the education while we have the, um, the means to provide the education until the supply chain opens up for fit test kits. Um, also, <clears throat> we are in the midst of getting grant um, proposals or grant 
statements in for federal funds that we're receiving for infection prevention training to be shared with first line and frontline workers. And this will be um, not just in long-term care, but in all settings. Um, CDC has developed some innovative ways to do on-site, on um, tele-education, I'm sorry, can't get my words out this morning, for infection prevention. And we're excited about this initiative. It's something that we think is needed um, because we're, we have found not only during um, this response in COVID, but also with Ebola, that the education for infection prevention often rests on that one individual responsible for that in the facility. So we're trying to really train more people that are across the board on the front line. So that's an exciting initiative that we are hoping to get rolled out soon. We're um, each day now working on those initiatives and we are looking forward to what that can afford for education going forward. And I think that's what I have um, now to report. And I'm, I'm sorry I don't have more detail information to give you, but it will be forthcoming. Well, thanks, Carol. We've had some questions um, in the <clears throat> chat box. May I, can I go ahead and ask those? Sure. This time? Okay, great. Um, are the infection control teams able to do Zoom or teleconference meetings instead of on-site if possible? So are you saying the, um, the teams that are coming from HHS? I believe that's what they're, this, call, this person's referring to, yes. They are coming um, on-site with a tool. Now, whether or not they could do a remote assessment, that's, that's a possibility. I will certainly ask Angela Spleen, who was coordinating that. Um, they were trained really to make this an on-site observation, and they're using the CDC ICAR tools specific to COVID. I do not think Zoom is a possibility, um, but whether or not this could be a tele-assessment, I will try to text her while, we're, while I'm still on this call and get an answer for that. Okay, great. Again, I, I also put her email um, in the chat in case anybody has specific questions about the assessments too. And I do know they are going, you know, across the state. I mean, they have gone to the very far southwest corner. You know, they're, they're really um, strategically positioned. There's like up to 12 teams. So we're trying to really get as many people boots on the ground as we can. Again, these are voluntary. They are not regulatory. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, can you please clarify what the requirements are for nursing home residents to participate in outside visits as stated in the phase one and two of the reopening guidance? I'm not sure if Kim Beasley's on from the OLC and could also um, comment on that. Yeah, um, I'm here, Dana. So the, re the question was, what is the requirement related to outside visits? Yes, it says, please clarify what the requirements are for nursing home residents to participate in outside visits as stated in the phase one and two of the reopening guidance. So I believe that's referring to some um, FAQs that were recently um, released by CMS, I believe on June 23rd. Um, where they have um, included information on some um, flexibility with um, providing um, outside visitation. It's certainly not a requirement. Okay, great. Um, and we'll try to get the link in um, on the chat box to that FAQ information. And and I just mm -hmm. will add, um, this is Carol, that we do have that as a frequently asked question in our um, written questions that are coming out as well. Okay. And, and you, it, and again, and you it, said you think they might be released today. I hope so. That is, you know, we've said that every day, but that, that is sort of their plan. Um, I, I will say that the question, as I'm looking at it and how it's written, um, does incorporate, you know, the infection prevention requirements of maintaining social distancing, wearing a face mask, visitors have a face mask, um, 
And if they need supervision, of course, to have an appropriate staff member be present with them. And that staff member would also have, have to have a face mask on. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, um, does the on-site infection control focus survey conducted by the OLC count for the infection prevention and control assessment, IPCA, for phase two? We learned last week during this call that it did, according to Sarah and the OLC. However, we had an OLC inspector state that it does not. Can you please clarify? So this is Kim Beasley. So our survey um, would certainly qualify um, for um, the the criteria to move um, throughout the the phases to progress uh, through the phases. I'm not sure, possibly, if um, the surveyor was maybe confused about if the um, if the other the IPCA um, survey took the place of ours or not. Maybe that was where the confusion came in. I'm not sure. Okay, great. Well, um, if there are any more questions about that, please put that in the chat box. Um, the next question is, can you please clarify the requirements for um, a resident and employee weekly testing? Stara stated on the call last week that a PPS in May could be used as the first baseline test, so that only um, one more test would be needed. However, during our local heart, local health department has stated this may not be accurate. Can you please clarify? Dana, that's also going to be in the FAQ. Um, so I'd, I'd like to just defer okay. that we, we wait for that. Sure. Okay. Um, the next question, if we had a PPS in May and then one in June, with no positive residents and minimal staff asymptomatic cases, will those two testing events be able to count as two tests to progress through the phases? Right, so do we have a date for that test in May? Again, I think that's something that we're gonna be specifying because this has come up over and over again, the question of a point prevalence survey that has occurred on or after um, or excuse me, before May 15. Um, so I, I'm sorry to not give you a direct answer, but if, I'm going to copy and paste that question and make sure that we are clarifying that in our FAQ because it is a very um, frequently asked question, as I should say, because of the dates that are involved. Okay, thank you. Um, this person clarified May 21st and June 16th. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question. Will the um, on-site OLC visit count for the CMS survey promised by July 31st? Uh, yes, yeah. So if, if OLC has been on-site to conduct a um, focused infection control survey um, so far, that does count for the requirement for um, for the July 31st deadline. Okay, um, thank you. Another question on page 13 um, of the nursing home guidance for reopening at the bottom under infection control states the OLC visit does not count. Can you does count? I'm sorry, someone was just commenting, providing that comment. Um, is next question, is there any recommendation regarding employees in healthcare who refuse to test? The Virginia Department of Health is coming in to conduct the point prevalence survey due to one positive resident and several employees. So if a um, employee refused to test, is there any guidance on that? Dana, are you asking that of, of VDH, um, HAI team, or of CAM, it was OLC. Yeah, I guess this, well, uh, of all, I mean, this, I've, I've been getting this question a lot, um, what to do if a, an employee 
uh, refuses to test. So um, any anyone on the phone who has any guidance would be helpful. Right. So what what we have said in our <clears throat> this is Carol. What we have said in our um, reopening guidance is there should be a plan of how to handle that. And I go back to the original intent of of testing. We want everyone to be educated why this is important, and we need to understand why they may refuse. Are they afraid, for instance, that they um, would lose their job, or are they afraid they don't have sick time? So again, reassuring that person of the importance of the test, what the implications are if they don't do this test, how they put themselves and others at danger if they don't. But we do not, um, our team does not give employment guidance as to how to handle that type of situation. So there needs to be a plan that I think you can share that with CMS if they should come and ask, or OLC if they should come and ask this question of how you're going to educate, address concerns, and what your plan is in place for that. Kim, does that satisfy what you all would be asking for? Correct. Um, we we would um, be looking at the facility to um, have a plan as to how they would um, handle those types of situations. Thank you. Um, the next question is, when will the regular annual OLC on-site inspections resume? Um, I have no idea as of yet. Um, CMS has opened the survey suspension slightly um, to include complaints um, related to immediate jeopardy, um, allegations of abuse and neglect, um, inappropriate discharge. So they've opened up the, the complaint investigation area um, a little bit more um, than just immediate jeopardy. And, um, and that's that's really about it um, outside of the additional um, uh, COVID surveys that they are requiring of us. So there's, you know, in addition to conducting the first round of surveys, which were due by July 31st, um, there are additional um, infection control survey requirements that, um, that we will be uh, conducting. So that along with um, slightly opening up the criteria for complaint investigations. Thanks, Kim. Um, the next question, or, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I no just problem. Go back, go back to the question about a team, uh, the HHS team yes. doing remote yes. assessments. And Angela, who is coordinating that effort for our team, wrote back and said, that she has asked one team if they would do that, and they said yes. So yes, if the team agrees to do that is, is my way to say um, we would have to check with them just to make sure they agree with that approach. So I think if there is a request to do a, a remote assessment versus an on-grounds assessment, if you will just let Angela know, she can see and check with the team. Okay, great. And again, her email address is in the chat box for anybody who needs it. Okay, um, the next one, we had a PPS last Wednesday and are still awaiting the test results. Is this typical of other communities' experience? Um, I guess if there's anybody who just wants to unmute and chime in if, if this is happening to you. If you're on the phone, you'd have to star six. So while we're waiting for people to unmute, this is Carol. We are hearing this. I think um, that that is unfortunate, um, and we're, we know that that is a, a delay, and it's causing a lot of angst. I'm guessing, I don't know this for sure, but as we're ramping up testing, as more and more um, surge in cases or, 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 excuse me, surge in testing is coming about, it could be delaying the larger facilities. As you know, we're having... Um, testing facilities, that is, we're having a, a large number of states across the country see an increase in tests and cases, which is probably taxing the, um, the lab response time a little bit. But if you have a specific lab that's having that happen <clears throat> and you want us to 
check into that to get a little bit more information. If you'll just include that in the chat box, we'll let you know. Okay, great. I think that kind of really um, addresses this uh, person's concern. Thank you. Um, the uh, next question, does testing for all residents and staff have to occur with every phase? Hey, this is Sarah Leinberger. Sorry, I, I think Carol, thank you, Carol, so much. I think Carol's got to hop off. Um, I've been listening in the background while I write a grant, but um, I, I can take that question and I, I think Carol has to hop off. So we are currently getting feedback from the um, from the long-term care task force on um, testing recommendations we've drafted for phases two and three. And so we are hoping to put that out. I hate to promise anything, but we're hoping to put that out um, early next week so that facilities can better plan for testing in phases two and three. We're, we're having a, another discussion about that tomorrow, but we're trying to finalize those recommendations. Okay, thanks, Sarah, and, and thanks for joining. Um, just a couple of comments came in about the PPS. Um, we had ours conducted last Wednesday, and we're still waiting on results. Another one, our PPS survey uh, results did take over a week. Um, yes, with our regional healthcare coalition in the state, and most are waiting 72 hours, five days. Our PPS was Monday. Um, told me to expect a week. So that seems to be um, the trend. Um, you also have to request individual results if you wish to have them. So uh, I'm so happy to have Sarah on. Um, and thank you, Carol, for um, helping. Are there, I'm not getting any other questions. Yep, here's one. Um, ours was, well, ours was June 17th, and it took multiple efforts over two weeks to get the individual results. Um, Sarah, since you're on, um, did you have any updates for us or any any particular issues you wanted to talk about, trends that you've been seeing um, related to the reopening guidance? I just wanted to mention, I know there were questions about um, the point prevalence surveys counting for sort of like that baseline test or the first round of testing. And so, I know Carol mentioned we're trying to address that in FAQs. What we have, and I don't expect this to change before, um, I'm trying to pull it up. I don't expect this to change um, when it's posted. Essentially, if you, and I think we might have said this last week on this call, that if you've conducted a point prevalence survey on or after May 15th, um, that would count as sort of that first round of testing. Okay. Well, any other questions in, for the chat box? I see some more folks have arrived um, to the call. Um, any questions uh, regarding the reopening guidance for Sarah? So we're looking at the FAQ um, to potentially be posted um, today. Um, any other development, Sarah, that you wanted to talk about? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, so we're working on the FAQs. We're working, as I said, on the phase two and three testing recommendations. Um, I believe that we will plan a couple of statewide webinars. We've mostly been giving updates to facilities on these association calls, which has been really great, um, but we might not be reaching all facilities in the state who might not be part of um, leading age or other associations. And there are some good examples in nursing homes that, you know, that have been happening. So we might plan a couple of statewide webinars. I don't have a timeline yet on that to highlight some, some best practices and certainly would, I'm open to any suggestions for facilities to highlight. One thing we would like to talk about is how to, you know, secure a testing contract if you don't have one and, and do that weekly testing. And so if there are any facilities who have been able to successfully do the weekly testing of staff and residents in their facility, um, 
following their initial baseline testing event, then that would be really helpful to highlight to other facilities sort of your experience and how to do that. Um, I, I think just to um, further talk about vaccination and planning for the fall, that that would potentially be a topic of an, an additional webinar. Um, I know Christy talked to you all this morning and that's great, but you know, for the fall and planning, our, our group hasn't had a lot of chance, a lot of opportunity to think about that yet, but we're thinking about flu and COVID and under, understand that CDC is potentially developing some materials about co-infections um, in the fall. And so, you know, may have a webinar, a statewide webinar for nursing homes to just think about the planning for the fall, including immunizations, but other other planning as well. Well, Sarah, um, before we get to some of the other questions that have entered into the chat box, I just wanted to thank you because you've been so helpful to um, to our members and all the information that you've provided and for the opportunity to weigh in on the draft testing recommendations yesterday. Um, we really appreciate that and all that um, the department is doing. So we have had some more questions come in. Um, once you receive baseline testing, does the weekly testing apply to all patients, positive patients, or a randomized, uh, random sample? So for the weekly testing, that would be all residents and staff who have not previously tested positive. So if someone previously tested positive, then they wouldn't need to be retested. And that that is in the reopening guidance document. Okay, great. Um, a question about fit test training. When will additional fit test training, the trainer classes be scheduled? Um, I, I don't know. I know there are several scheduled in July. I'm not sure if a need has been identified to schedule more. I think there are five or six. I don't, do for, are folks hearing that they're already full? I can certainly, I know Carol said she talked to Susie recently. We can cer certainly loop back with that team at VDH and, and see if sessions are already full and if they're planning to schedule additional sessions. I know they said they would be able to if needed. And just to let everybody know, in our updates, we have the information on how to register for that. You'll have to fill out an OSHA medical questionnaire. There's a course ID number. Um, so all of that information that you need to um, get that scheduled is in our update um, from yesterday and to the and that's going out today. Um, someone said that they had been waitlisted. Um, oh, Sarah, okay, no, just to let you know. Yeah, that's good feedback. Okay, um, another question. If we do a testing and include agency staff and they test positive, are we required to submit those positives to VDH through the FRI? The reason I ask is because agency staff work at multiple facilities. Sure, I think that we have a question in our FAQ document about staff working across multiple facilities. They certainly don't need to be tested at both facilities. Um, so ideally results could be shared. I'm gonna pull up the language, language we've drafted for that, but I don't know, Kim, if you wanna speak directly to the FRI. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes, if we do testing and include agency staff and they test positive, are we required to submit those positives to VDH through an FRI? The reason I ask is because agency staff work at multiple facilities. We had only asked, um, uh, initially, we only asked for FRIs to be submitted if it was a, a uh, your first resident or your first staff member positive. So for ongoing testing, no, a FRI is not necessary. Okay, great, thanks. And Sarah, another comment, there is a need, we have been wait, they, we've been waitlisted as well. Okay. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I'll um, definitely take that back. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the next question, if our PPS was prior to May 15th and we've had no positive cases for over 14 days, 
Are two weekly resident and staff retests sufficient to meet the requirement, or do we need a three in total on or after May 15th? You only need two in total for all staff and residents on or after May 15th. Okay, great. Is there any guidance on the type of swab used? If we can only get the oral swab, is that sufficient to meeting the testing requirement? That is a great question. And we also have something in the FAQs about that. Hold on, give me one second to pull it up. Um, okay. I mean, there are, other, there are other swabs. It essentially, that, that could be used for testing. It essentially, um, you just need to check with your lab to see what your lab is validated to process. So many of the labs we've been using have been doing the nasopharyngeal or MP swabs, but some labs are validated to test OP swabs or possibly just like a nasal swab. And so you basically would need to check with your, with your lab. And um, we received a question yesterday from a member about access to swabs. Um, is that something that, that can be requested through the Regional Healthcare Coalition? No, I learned that the Regional Healthcare Coalition do not have laboratory supplies. Um, I'm not sure that that's something we've really thought through. I mean, we. We, there have been supply chain issues, as you all know, at the beginning of the pandemic about lab testing supplies, and that was one of the reasons it took a while for testing to ramp up. So, like, even at our public health labs, we didn't have enough swabs. So, there's been a lot of work statewide to get enough swabs to the labs um, to push out for testing. So, I guess some labs might supply the swabs. If the labs don't have the swabs, then it might be something else we need to look into if you're not able, if your lab is telling you they don't have the swabs and that you have to secure the swabs yourself. Um, typically when we do public health testing, the swab kits are provided by the lab. So it's a question I can take back to the testing team, whether these private labs are going to require the facility to obtain swabs. I think that's going to be uh, challenging. So let me take that back. Okay, but we had a comment. The, uh -huh. Yeah, I do know that the healthcare coalitions do not have lab testing supplies. Okay, that's good to know. Um, a comment came in, lab said they aren't validated for sensitivity or specificities because of the waiver with the FDA related to the emergency, but have positive predictive values in range. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. okay. Did, did you have a comment, Sarah, before I go on to the next question? No. Okay. Um, under the definition of staff and the reopening guidance, it includes contractual staff not employed by the facility. Did I hear correctly that the guidance does not recommend that we test agency staff? Mm, what does that mean? What is agency staff? I'm assuming that's where the um, community has gone through an employment agency and obtain staff. Did you, the person asking this question, want to provide any clarification? That's, they confirm what so, I said. So, any staff working in the facility need to be tested as part of a testing event, but if a staff member has been tested at another facility or by a contracting agency, then each facility just needs to obtain documentation of the test result um, and ensure that the results from one setting are adequate to meet, you know, the testing recommendations at your facility. And so each facility should maintain appropriate documentation of test results. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, while we have Sarah, and yep, more questions coming. Um, we had our original PP testing on May 14th, all negative. We had a positive in staff on June 14th. We have tested 
and scheduled again for July 17th? Do we need to conduct two weekly tests in conjunction to the upcoming, uh, I'm thinking this is point prevalence testing, or can we count the May 14th date and the July 17th date as two weekly? Unsure how completed. I received this as a private message, Sarah, so I'm gonna post this in to everyone without any community identifying information because there were a lot of dates there mentioned. Um, so actually, I'll just send it over to you, Sarah. Are you able to see the chat? So yeah, I can see the chat. So what we're recommending, again, is that every facility conducts at least two facility-wide testing events on or after May 15th, and that's, you know, all residents, all staff. So for this scenario, if you've scheduled another point problem survey, that's great. That can count as one of those weekly testing events. But I would encourage you to go ahead and do another testing event to count as the second weekly testing event. And that could be, I mean, July, I don't July, mid-July, that's you know a couple weeks away. So you could do a weekly testing event before that like before July 17th. Okay, great. Does that uh, person who submitted that question to me privately have any other questions about your scenario? You can send those to me. Um, someone commented about the FIT testing that they were able to schedule um, testing the testing course for um, July uh, 13th. Um, and that person who submitted the question, um, they do not have any additional questions regarding that. Um, any more questions for Sarah? Um, are two PPS required for assisted living and memory care also, or is this just in nursing homes? So as you all know, assisted living facilities fall under Department of Social Services. They've recommended that ALS follow the VDH guidance. But that's not a requirement from DSS. Um, so I, I think I would just defer to what the facility decides to do and maybe talk to DSS about that. Um, I do know that the National Guard is scheduling ALF to do a, a baseline testing event, if you haven't already, through the end of August. Um, so if an ALF is, in, is interested in scheduling a baseline testing event, I would encourage you to go ahead and do that with the VANG while we have them and, and they're calling ALF proactively, I believe, to schedule those. But in terms of doing additional testing, um, you know, I would, I would recommend you talk to your DSS representatives about that, but I, I don't think that it's required. Um, Sarah, so we shared a memo that we had from you all yesterday about nursing homes needing to schedule their point prevalence survey no later than July 6th, uh, and that the contact person with the National Guard is Gregory Chu. Would that also be the contact person for assisted livings to schedule a PPS? Yes, you can use Colonel Chu. Um, I think that's fine. I think he has a team working on that. And I believe that's the cutoff for nursing homes. I don't know if that's the cutoff for assisted living, but I would encourage you to go ahead and reach out if you would like to, if you haven't talked to the guard already and you're in an assisted living facility, I would encourage you to go ahead and reach out and try to get on that schedule. Okay, um, great. Yes, the, the letter that we shared was for nursing homes only and that the deadline was July 6th. Uh, to get that scheduled. And so just to clarify, um, when I shared that memo with our members, I got some follow-up questions about do they still need to reach out to Colonel Chu if they um, already have been in contact with the National Guard and got something in the works. Um, so I wouldn't think that they would need to follow up. Is that correct? Um. 
Sorry, if they need to follow up if what? What was the question? So the memo um, that we I shared yesterday from the Department of Health um, that nursing homes need to have everything scheduled regarding their PPS by July 6. Um, I received a couple of questions from members that said that they had been in the touch with the National Guard and that they were getting them scheduled and wanted to know if they still needed to contact Colonel Chu. Oh no, I would say if you're already in process, then then that then I don't think that you need to reach out again. I, I know that that to to guide a facility through the whole process, there are many steps. So if you've already been in contact with the National Guard and you're sort of in the queue or in in the process of scheduling that, then they should they should reach back out to you. Okay, great. Um, another question: If you're a continuing care retirement community, does all staff testing? only include the nursing home staff? Um, that's a good question. Um, for a CCRC, I would just encourage you to think about how if your staff overlap in different parts of your community or not, if the nursing home staff are fairly um, you know, contained and that they're, they only work on the nursing home unit you know, that's great, and you could just focus on those staff. If there are, like, ancillary staff or therapists, that kind of thing, who might cross over into different parts of your facility, I would encourage you to think about testing all staff who who work in the nursing home, even if they work in other sections as well. Does that make sense? Um, that does to me. I, I'll ask the person to put the question in, in the chat box if they need any further clarification. So I'll let them do that um, while we're asking the, uh, ask the next question. If we completed a point prevalence survey but did not use the National Guard, the local, heart, local Department of Health worked with us and our nurses obtained state lab specimens that were sent to the UV, a UVA lab, could we still ask the National Guard to do a second point prevalence survey? Yes. I would encourage you to go ahead and reach out and try to get that scheduled. But yes, I, if you haven't used the National Guard yet, then that's certainly still an option. Okay, great. Okay, give it a second here and see um, any more questions. Uh, Sarah, when do you think the testing recommendations will be um, available that we've been working on? I think um, early next week is what we're shooting for. I don't think that that will be finalized this week. We're, we have another discussion with stakeholders tomorrow, but we're we're trying to push that out early next week. Okay, great. Well, I'm not getting any additional uh, questions. So just giving it a second, just okay. Well, um, we'll end a little early today. Um, thanks, everybody. These are all great questions. As soon as the FAQ becomes available, uh, we'll get that out to you and keep you posted on the testing recommendations as we work with the department on those. So thank you to Sarah, Carol, and Christy, and thanks again, everybody on the phone, and hope you have a great rest of the week.